Okay, uh, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is November 19th, 2021, and it's 11 a.m., so I will uh, kick this meeting off. Um, I have a few administrative issues to cover before we get started, but um, before I do that, I um, just need to make a quick adjustment to our agenda for today. Um, we need to add a discussion about co-location um, and review some proposed language from David around this. Um, and so I suggest that we do that following our discussion of the 903 criteria, but before we turn to buffer zones. <clears throat> so um, just, we should do a motion for that. Okay, uh, so I move that we uh, uh, adjust the agenda to include a discussion of um, co-location. So, so All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, so a few administrative details. Um, the board, uh, Brent and I and our consultants um, addressed the Ways and Means Committee earlier. We presented our uh, market analysis and fee structure, um, as well as our social equity criteria, all contained in our October 15th report. Um, there was, it was a very um, kind of overview style meeting. Um, no decisions were made. However, uh, there were some interesting discussions um, around the fee structure, uh, local fees and social equity. So I would encourage everyone to check out the video of that. It's available on the Ways and Means YouTube channel. Um, last night, we held the first of two social equity town hall meetings um, in Winooski. Um, there was uh, good attendance. Um, we heard um, our consultants led it, uh, led the conversation. They're going to be um, trying to condense uh, what they heard into a report back to the board. Um, so uh, the next one is um, tomorrow. It's at the Waterbury State Office Complex at 11 a.m. So we encourage folks to attend those. Um, Again, the point of these really is the board has made some um, initial recommendations around um, who should qualify as a social equity applicant, what those benefits should be for a social equity licensee, and then also how we can embed social equity into the kind of foundation, the DNA of the entire cannabis industry. Um, however, we really want to hear from people of the public um, and people that have been impacted by the war on drugs is how we can do that more effectively. And so um, our consultants are leading the con those conversations in these town hall meetings, but they're really trying to rely on um, the attendees and members of the public to help them understand how we can do this specific to Vermont. Um, just a note that however we land on social equity, this is an area that we're going to continue to revisit and we're going to continue to um, expand upon as you know, at every, at every angle, at, at every turn, every every time we make decisions. Um, later today, uh, I think at one o'clock, we're going to have a meeting of our full advisory committee, two o'clock. Um, and uh, David and Bryn are going to run through the proposed rules, um, try and get some input and discussion going on those uh, with our advisory committee members. And then um, the plan is for the board to meet next Tuesday and to hopefully vote uh, on those rules so that we can then submit them, pre-file them um, with ICAR. So that will kind of start the rulemaking process. Um, and, uh, you know, if uh, everything goes our way, which it often does not, um, then uh, we will be on track for the kind of original set of timelines that are in Act 164 and Act 62. So has everyone here had a chance to review our minutes from November 12th? Yes. Yeah. And uh, I take a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Okay. So why don't we turn to the agenda? I think we're starting with Kyle with um, some slides and recommendations around lab standards, operating procedures, some of our testing requirements. Can you reach? Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. This one. Okay, so I want to start by briefly mentioning <clears throat> laboratories, laboratory SOPs. These will really be, um, well, first of all, these will not be in our, our rulemaking process. These will be procedures set out um, through uh, Title II that the board will kind of keep and offer, offer the kind of um, foundational element on how lab, private labs, third-party labs set their standard operating procedures. And just so folks understand what these what these protocols will look like, oops, what these um, protocols will look like, Oregon's protocols, and mixed in with with how our hemp program typically looks at SOPs. You know, Oregon, the way that they do things, they have labs do the sampling. And I think in in this state, from the hemp perspective, we're used to a different system where inspectors uh, might be sampling. Uh, producer's product and bringing it to the state lab um, or having folks do a, a quality check with private labs and bringing that sample and dropping off. And I don't think, one, we've got the lab capacity um, to have labs sending inspectors into the field, and that's just not what we're used to. So we're going to be making some adjustments. Um, these will include uh, things on how to take a representative sample, how to preserve your chain of custody to make sure that things don't get uh, mixed and matched, so on and so forth. It'll have, these are just a, uh, an example. This list is not exhaustive on procedures that will be included. We're fortunate enough to have Kim Watson on our subcommittee who helped write the Oregon SOPs and uh, they're fantastic. Um, so if folks do want to preview, you can you can go look at protocols for Oregon and look at protocols for our hemp program. And, and we're, we're working to, to find a way to align those two. But again, they will not be making their way into the laboratory section of our of our rule. This will occur through procedure and be kept with the board. This will um, it's suggested by the subcommittee that this this do and myself that with this do make it into rule. And this is kind of the testing requirements. And there's a lot on this page. Um, and there's a chart here with some notes that helps explain certain things. And there are some ac accommodations that the subcommittee suggests. That we that we make um, to help folks understanding that certain components of the six these six buckets can be cost prohibitive in certain situations. And I have Carrie Jagger here from the Vermont Agency of Agriculture to help me walk through some things if if there are questions that I, I don't feel comfortable answering. But one thing that I think is a is a good suggestion because we do hear sometimes how um, pesticide testing can be one of the most cost prohibitive components of lab testing if um, a producer is certified by a third party to be pesticide free, we would have the, the potential ability to waive the pesticide lab testing requirement and make those types of small accommodations. But this really from the um, harvest lot perspective, plant material perspective, concentrate perspective, and infused product perspective across all six of these buckets kind of gives an understanding about how and what needs to be tested or what special accommodations could potentially be made um, in lieu of testing. Can you say that again about the pesticides? So if, we're, if they're certified to be pesticide free, mm -hmm. they've already gone through a process, right? Right. So there's assuming no need for an additional. Test, Correct. And right? we would still have that kind of inspection authority to where if, if there if there are issues, we could come in and and um, course correct there. Okay. Anything to add, Carrie? All right. I'm feeling good. <laughs> <laughs> there's other, you know, um, some situations here, for instance, if we look at note five, testing for heavy metals is required whenever the cannabis crop land was used for orchard crops or any land use other than farming as defined in the RAPs, unless a recent soil test demonstrates that heavy metals are within the authorized action limits for soils. Um, you know, note seven, testing for other contaminants is necessary when the Agency of Natural Resources has approved biosolid applications to cropland. So there's some special unique depending on if you're the land you're growing on from an outdoor perspective was previously agricultural land or zoned something else you might need to do certain things depending on um, where you're growing and, and those those that, that's unique to specific uh, grow sites. So it'll be important that folks familiarize themselves with this and labs understand where the product may be coming from. So we kind of understand how accommodations can be made for certain folks. 
So from a, a parameter perspective, what I think is most important for us to include into rules is parameters. Action limits should be stay, should stay with the board and under Title II. Um, and, th and this will be a theme throughout the rest of this slide deck. Action limits should be set through procedure and stay with the board. There's a number of different reasons why we do so. I think as we move along to some of these other buckets, it'll be more prevalent than this one necessarily. But total THC, obviously, we need to understand potency. Some states ask for total THC, total or THCA, CBD, all the other kind of cannabinoids that you would expect to see on a COA. I think what we should focus on is is potency as a requirement. I think. Uh, uh, producers or manufacturers and labs can work together to <clears throat> provide all of that additional information if a producer wants it or a retailer wants it to better market their products because some folks want to understand exactly the can cannabinoidal content within their product other folks might not necessarily do so and i view that as more of a business decision than something that we need to require can and i think say what action limits mean Action yeah. limits. So action limits are the so for in, in this instance, the action limit would be, you know, 30% flower potency. So it can't be over 30% per statute and 60% per concentrate. I mean, an example that's based on some of the recent recommendations we're making to the legislature of why this action limit shouldn't be necessarily in step or in rule is because we're suggesting that some of the 60% concentrate limit go away. So if that's in rule and in and in statute, and we're trying to remove it from the statutory perspective, it's easier for us through procedure to do that in-house versus also have to unwind it through a rule. Thank you. So this is more of a compliance question, but is there any wiggle room on the 30%? Like in the hemp world, I think if you're like, if, if someone's 30, 30.1%, 30.1% THC, I mean, are we requiring, well, I don't have to ask you, but I'm just saying, is there is there wiggle room in the hemp world? Um, maybe Carrie is the right person to ask. If something is close, but maybe a little bit over, a little bit under. There's a lot of, lot of wiggle room. Yeah. There's a statutorily defined uh, measure of uncertainty. Yeah. And pretty hard line limit. There's there's a error, an analytical yeah. error that's yeah. built into the Okay. That thirty percent, and it's ten percent is not out of the question. Really? Okay. So for all the other cannabinoids uh, that could be guaranteed on a product under the hemp rule, ten percent. Okay. Less or nine percent. Okay, and so that's, and that's uh, within ten percent. Right. Okay. All right. Just that's what I thought that was there for. Yep. So <clears throat> moisture, I think, is the one exception to the to the. Um, proposal that only parameters live in rule and action limits live through procedure because this will kind of stay the same. Um, that 13% is pretty pretty across the board for how we view on a dry weight basis versus on a on a wet basis. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's not necessarily, you know, a public health concern. Plus the wetter it is, the more opportunity for bacterial growth and other molds and so on and so forth to happen. So if the Water content, so that equates to shelf stability. Yes. And so, um, is there like a set time where something can stay on a shelf at thirteen percent if it's flour? I, I'll defer to, to carry it, but I think I think it depends on a variety of factors: how it's stored, what humidity level it's at, what temperature it's at, what product it's in, is it air sealed? But yeah. I, I think it can be stored and preserved that. CBD or THC content for up to a year under the right conditions, but okay. not necessarily. Yeah. Okay. The, pro the product is stable. That's that. Okay. Your level or, or water activity. So. Yeah. And after that, it's consumer preference. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. It'll so, be on the label when it was cultivated or when it was packaged. So. Make that determination on their own. So, microbiological parameters and limits. Again, parameters here. These um, six parameters: bacteria and fungi. Fungi will live in our role. The action limits are none detected. 
um, and we've got it. Uh, we'll, we'll make procedures through methodology, through understanding methodology on how labs would seek to achieve this yeah. undetected level. And and a lot of this came from a microbiologist that or, that we have heard a lot from yeah. um, as suggestions for the subcommittee to include. I've found that, and I think the subcommittee members would agree that. There's six buckets here all under this umbrella, but and we've we've understood this by talking with the Vail Lab and stuff like that. People are very specific to their area of expertise, so we've really tried to utilize that and understand that and, and utilize some experts. But again, um, all of this will still be put out for public comment. The metal parameters and limits. Again, these parameters. What, what would be tested for will live in our rule. The action limits again, and this gets back to certain um, cultivation sites and and what will necess be necessary to test, you know, and this kind of gets back to, you know, public health and and how costly some things can be and um, to test for. And that's why action limits, I think, should live through procedure because we've got to balance what's a healthy level to be at versus, okay, this is really prescriptive. It's hard for any producer to meet a certain level, where can we make accommodations? And that'll allow us to kind of slide the scale a little bit mm -hmm. if, if we feel like we need to, because none of the product is making it out consistently from lab testing. Pesticide parameters and limits. Um, this is this is coming straight from the Agency of Agriculture and their hemp program. Carrie, any any comments? I think what, what we'll do is we'll likely put in some language either through procedure or into our rules on we should we should meet with the Agency of Agriculture at least on an annual basis to understand which pesticide products are being registered, what's being used, what's being sold, so we can understand in theory what products are being used for this um, you know specific market and, and how we can look to make sure that that we know what's being utilized. And, and there's other measures we've talked about through cultivation plans and reporting requirements to understand what actually will be used. So residual solvent parameters and limits. This is the, the one exception where I, I, I think the parameters and the action limits need to live um, both through procedure with the board. I think in talking with a lot of folks, these parameters, it's kind of if, if I'm thinking back to our Delta 8, Delta 9, Delta 10, chasing our own tail, if we try and, you know, prescribe certain, um, you know, of those kind of limits or parameters here, there's always new methodologies popping up. Um, we'd be chasing our own tail and constantly having to update this list. So this is the list and the action limits that that should um, reside with the board, and we can kind of add or subtract or change action limits as appropriate moving forward. And I think what what we, we can do through our rulemaking process is set which solvents or how solvents are treated from the tier one, tier two manufacturing perspective, what methods are used where um, from a, a danger to you know, public health, but also from a, a public safety perspective, and then just keep this with us so we can kind of update, because I, I expect this to kind of be the one area um, where folks get creative and find new ways to, um, you know, to, to manufacture. Carrie, any, any Additions there? Not as much as No, I, Sherman, I do see your hand. I think what we'll do, just because you were involved in the production of these slides, I think no. we'll get through them and give you a chance and not as, as part of a public comment. Okay. Yep. So, so Sherman, do you want to kind of, uh, because you were involved in making these slides, you maybe make a comment? Oh, uh, no, I just wanted to just mention that. This list of analytes, these are pesticides, not solvents. Oh, I, I did. Okay, yeah. I my think, bad. Thank yeah. you, Sherman. That's my fault. <laughs> if we go, if we go, oh, no. if you give me a second to kind of update while you do your slides, yeah, I'll, sure. I'll pull it back up. Okay. Thanks that, for catching that, Sherman. Yeah, thank you. I'm copying and pasting too much. Sorry, I like it too. <laughs> okay. I apologize to everybody on the on the call too. And while you're taking slides, the reason for keeping those in rule is uh california is sort of epa registered pesticides for use on cannabis or ithc cannabis but california has taken it upon themselves to do the 
inhalation toxicity studies. So those numbers will change as those California studies come out. You don't want to have to go through rulemaking in order to change the action levels. You can just change your procedure. Yeah. As the as those as that data becomes available. Okay. All right, so um, this portion of the agenda is, again, related to this 7 VSA 903. Uh, this is not a new conversation for the board, but it is uh, one that um, opens up a certain can of worms. So I think the more discussion we can have, uh, the better. So this is just a reminder of what 7 VSA 903 asks the board to consider. Um, so the board shall issue licenses um, pursuant to this chapter as determined according to a system of priorities adopted by rule by the board and the priority shall require consideration of criteria and then it lists six criteria. So the way that I see it is that we're already giving priority to existing medical cannabis dispensary license holders in good standing. So I kind of eliminate that for the purpose of this conversation. We're also giving um, priority to uh, criteria number two, um, you know, whether applicants would foster social justice and equity by being a minority or women owned business. So we already have our social equity program, which covers um, minorities and we have our DEI program or uh, that covers women owned businesses and and other um, minorities that might not be captured under our social equity. So for the purposes of this conversation, I think those those two buckets are already being given priority. So I would just hold the hold a comment on those. Um, we've decided um, that number six is going to be an inherent authority of the board that we need to continuously look at the needs of the market. And we decided that that's one way that we can kind of shift people in the queue. Um, you know, if we've licensed, you know, 60 small cultivators and no retail operations, we might need to shift focus or no testing facilities. You know, we need to be able to look at the entire supply chain and make sure we have a well-functioning, uh, you know, industry. So I think we have uh, an inherent authority to do six. So I'm not going to talk about six, number six either. So that really leaves three four and five. And we have minimum application requirements already on some of these issues. So um, the way that I kind of see this working is we create some um, standards over and above what we've created already. And we hold our larger um, companies that are applying either for, you know, certain license types and kind of like we did with uh, outdoor security, we have kind of a, a list of things that they can do, those license applicants, where they can kind of go over and above um, our minimum standards and, um, and that their application will be deemed incomplete if they don't do some of those additional steps. And what an application deemed incomplete will mean is that their place is held in the queue but we send an RFI, a request for more information to those applicants, which says we find that you have not satisfied the minimum criteria under the under these for these reasons. And we ask that you respond to this with how you're going to actually achieve some of these criteria. We'll hold your place in line, but we're going to continue to review other applications. So it kind of it, it is a priority system. Um, and I think it achieves the purpose of 903. So I'm looking first at the criteria around whether the applicant proposes specific plans to recruit, hire, and implement and development ladders for minorities, women, or individuals who have been historically disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. So I haven't quite decided, you know, at what level you need to choose one or more of these, uh, or we're going to require one or more of these. But I thought these would be some things that we could further define in policy, but essentially would be the types of things that I think would 
create development ladders for um, minorities, women, or individuals who've been historically disproportionately impacted. So um, inclusive hiring and contracting practices. This is how we make the kind of entire industry beyond just applicants, uh, social equity applicants, um, you know, e equitable. So, um, you know, there's lots of research out there. There's lots of suggestions on how um, kind of your HR processes can be more inclusive and your contracting processes can be more inclusive. You know, we don't have to get too specific, I think, in rule, but we could just, and we could have a kind of supplemental document about ways to achieve this. Um, paying a livable wage, if you remember, this is actually criteria four, so I just included it here, because um, if you're having an inclusive hiring process and you're paying a livable wage, I think you achieve um, kind of the goal of this criteria. We could include, you know, paid leave, other sorts of kind of employee benefit programs um, into this as well. So it doesn't just have to be livable wage. Um, having an incubator or an accelerator program that provides assistance to social equity um, or our DEI businesses. And, you know, the, this, I gave some examples of what this could look like, but, you know, I would really, you know, we could, again, have some more clarification in a um, policy document or guidance, but um, some ideas would be, you know, we know that access to land, access to capital is the biggest barrier to small businesses from for entering this. So, you know, you could have, you know, a, a bigger licensee, you know, large cultivator that is providing grants or access to capital to social equity or DEI businesses or offering space. Um, and this ties into our co-location. This is kind of what, you know, jogged my memory about we needed to talk about co-location. So you could have kind of a, a cultivator, large cultivator that sets aside a portion of um, his or her cultivation space for and rent them out or give them out to social equity applicants. Um, cool. You could have management training or other forms of kind of technical assistance that these larger cultivators could provide for social equity, DEI businesses, um, mentorship programs. Um, this actually wasn't supposed to be part of the incubator, but it could, I mean, I guess it kind of falls into it, but just um, what Massachusetts has is they require um, their larger licensees to do their own community reinvestment. So it kind of bypass the like legislative aspect of this, but just have their larger folks need to invest in, you know, communities that have been disproportionately impacted, nonprofits that kind of help, um, you know, disproportionately impacted folks. Or we could just have kind of a minimum contribution to the community development fund. I know we talked about ongoing commitments from our integrated license holders. I think um, it should really apply to any of the larger players. Um, and that's the community development fund, as we all know, is the kind of revolving loan fund that's designed to help provide uh, financial support to um, social equity applicants. And then, you know, I, I don't know whether this should come just like the certified B Corp to me is an interesting idea. Um, I think that that covers a lot of both the environmental and social aspects, you know, so I, I'm trying to determine in my mind whether that's sufficient in and of itself to kind of cover some of these other things. Um, Cause you have to reach a minimum score on that kind of uh, B Corp a, a assessment, your impact assessment, and it includes all of these other things, you know, your inclusive hiring practices, what, what benefits you offer your employees, um, and so, and your environmental impact as well. Yeah, the B Corp really looks at your triple bottom line. Right. Um, and there's other Vermont companies that we all know, like Cabot yeah. and Ben and Jerry's that, have, that are B Corps. Right. Yes, and there's some recruitment research that says that people who are entering the workforce now are looking for B Corps to work for. Mm -hmm. So it could be, that if you're a certified B Corp, mm -hmm. you don't have to, you know, if we say, for instance, you know, you're a, a tier six cultivator, you need to have, you need to do four of these criteria, three of these criteria. It could be that if you certify as a B Corp, that you only have to do that, you know, something along those lines. Um, and that's something that on my procedure train that I've been talking about through the different contexts, we could set something like that through that as well. Yeah. So, uh, um, let's have a discussion about this now. Or, I mean, I could go to the next slide, which is more about the environmental and sustainability. But um, the questions that I 
haven't worked out in my head yet are do we apply this to all license types? Um, are we going to require this, for instance, of testing facilities, um, product manufacturers? Um, you know, do we apply it to all businesses once they hit a certain revenue? Um, do we apply it just to cultivation, just to retail? Um, that, that's a question, open question that I have. And then also, do we waive this entirely for small cultivators, um, the folks that we're really trying to encourage? Um, you know, we could require plans for some of this stuff for small cultivators, but not penalize them if they don't um, actually achieve those plans. And by penalize them, it really is that your application is incomplete unless you have mm -hmm. plans for some of these things. Um, and then the question, and then the, the secondary question, which is related is, do we require one? You get to choose kind of which one you want. Do we require multiple? Um, and is that dependent upon the type of license and the size of license? So the reason that, <clears throat> I mean, not the sole reason, but one of the reasons that an organization would do this is to get sort of expedited priority in the process, right? So it makes sense to me that um, we might, if, if we don't apply this to small cultivators, that we would have to, somewhere else, we would have to prioritize them so that they're not, if, if we're going to waive this for them, we don't want to put them behind people who do, organizations that do provide all of this. Well, um, but it makes sense to me yeah. not to include the small cultivators because they yeah. might be one person or two people or yeah. family, you know, that's, that's cultivating. So the small cultivators do get to go first by yeah. law. Um, so they will have that advantage built in. But I also would say that this doesn't actually move people around in the queue. Okay. It, it, all it does is if you're applying for a 25,000 square foot indoor cultivation site and you haven't filled out how you're going to have an inclusive hiring plan, you haven't filled out what your plan for paying a livable wage, you haven't made any commitments under the incubator program, you haven't certified as a B Corp, we would pause your application and send it back and say you haven't satisfied any of these criteria. You have, you know, if you respond to us, we'll keep your place in line and your application will be complete once you've responded. Um, and then you can, you'll keep, you know, we'll review your application, you know, in the chronological order where we received it, noting that we're going to move on. But I don't really anticipate us moving anyone in the queue based upon, oh, this person has a better, you know, incubator program than mm -hmm. this, than this small cultivator. And when we're when you say pausing their place in line, we would still continue to consider it just when they come back with that information. Like right. They first consider. Yeah. Right. So I really like this because I think it touches on some of the things that the social equity subcommittee talked about. Right. Yeah. Like we talked, we've already talked about providing guidance on on the hiring and contracting plans, and then what you talked about with cultivation was very much like what they talked about um, for a cooperative. But their recommendation was that we set it up. We talked about all the reasons that that might be challenging. This would allow that to sort of be set up through the market. Yeah, I'd like to explore how we, again, recognizing that we still need to make some procedural determinations on how we utilize these yeah. um, these concepts. Yeah. And I see why we need to talk about the retail qualification because right. if we do apply it to all the licenses that. It could be a, a local general store that provides that space, right? right. And we have <clears throat> All so moving on to the next slide, this is around the um, whether the product incorporates principles of environmental resiliency or sustainability, including energy efficiency. So, you know, I think Kyle, you've done a really excellent job in our last, I think there are the last two meetings in October setting our kind of minimum standards for how, what we're going to require on the cultivation side, both from a waste management and from a growing practice and, and efficiency standards. Um, and I know that uh, just looking at this first bullet, that there is no USDA organic certification for cannabis. Um, so, you know, I'm really thinking about just what those we have kind of minimum agricultural requirements from, from your slides, Kyle. And I'm thinking, you know, if you want to go above this, if you want to get this kind of third party certification, um, I know we've all heard clean green mentioned a few times. I don't know which other ones exist. 
but you know i was thinking if you move it ahead of the cannabis world like the and nofa certificate organic certification like the caps program you know if you if you go above kind of our bare minimum requirements using organic principles or regenerative principles that um that could be one criteria that um that you could choose for a lot if you're a larger um larger tier cultivator you could choose from this list and that could be one choice same with the efficiency and waste standards yeah i i well i appreciate that i think i like where, where your head's at and where you're going i, I want to be clear to folks listening or viewing this slide that I think you're referring to specific practices as outlined in the National Organic Program as what you need to do to become certified through USDA to be organic. That doesn't necessarily, even if you're applying those, those um, practices or standards to your operation for cannabis here in Vermont, that does not mean that we're de facto certifying your operation organic and we need to be very clear that folks do not try and label their product as organic it's just utilizing some of those requirements or parameters that are used to, to measure your your you know your products the same that they do on the federal level we can't allow folks to to claim their product as organic at, at this point in time right so i just want to make sure folks are clear on that but there is you know using um different classes of pesticides or fungicides or not doing any of the sort would, you know, be found on that list amongst many other growing practices, you know, crop rotation, planting stuff when you're not, you know, planting cannabis, so on and so forth. There's a lot of concepts there that I think would be important for us to know and would certainly fit in here. It's just what that word organic means is is something found in federal law. I want to make sure we're not running yeah, about that. Right. Um, and then, you know, we, we are going to have minute, minimum efficiency requirements and waste standards. And, you know, I think everything that um, Efficiency Vermont told us is you really want to incentivize people to go above those um, to the extent you can. So, um, you know, to the extent that we can encourage that through the application process, I think we should be doing that, um, including sourcing from renewables. You know, we've heard a lot about just the plastic waste, consumer waste um, that's involved. Uh, and so really, um, and I guess this would be mostly on the product manufacturing side, but maybe from a retail um, side as well, but really encouraging recyclable, compostable, reusable materials, um, you know, recyclable lights for the cultivation side. Um, yeah, well, even on the, on the waste, you know, perspective, there are a lot of the, the traditional child-proof containers are petroleum-based plastic. There is bioplastic and, and hemp. Plastic, right? Which would be a bioplastic, but alternatives to petroleum-based plastic is just at a much higher cost per unit. Right. So, if you're making that business decision to move away from, you know, the traditional product, that's something that I think would make perfect sense for yeah. us to consider and, and help expedite if you're, you know, balancing your own social progress <laughs> versus your financial burden to do so. Right. That's something that we would want to know. Um, having just like we in the last slide would have contributions to the community development funds, um, you know, on this slide, we could have contributions to anti pollution or carbon offsets. And then once again, certifies a B Corp. And I'm not sure actually that I think about it. If B Corp actually allows cannabis companies to certify, but we could have, um, we could use the same kind of impact assessment, just it wouldn't they wouldn't be able to call themselves a B Corp. Some, some of those same impact assessments could be part of our guidance document here. Yeah, I know a lot more about the organic standard than yeah. B Corps, but I'm sure it wouldn't be hard for us to find out if they do or are willing to <coughs> do that. But again, we, we can make that clear to folks. Yeah. So um, conceptually, I think we're all kind of in agreement. Mm -hmm. um, I think the specifics of each of this, these criteria need to be worked out a little bit more in policy. Um, and I think the specifics around what we require and of whom we require it still need to be worked out. I think we could probably do that before Tuesday though. Um, and we can just have, we can circle back to this on Tuesday. Yeah. That sound right? Yep. Yeah.
Anyone want to add anything to any of these bullet points that come to mind? I know it's kind of. I got more granular when I first proposed some stuff for purposes of this slide way back, yeah. you know, even. Which which were cool in, in concept and theory, maybe not appropriate for the priority perspective, but I'd still I think a lot of this can spill over to other programs we hope to stand up with in our jurisdiction that helps, you know, let folks who want to go above and beyond the call of environmental duty to kind of rise above and uh, and get some type of I keep saying gold star or some right. some equivalent um, from us. Yeah. You know, it doesn't carry the same weight as an organic label, but it might mean something if, if it's crafted yeah. the right way. And I ran these by Andrew Livingston at VS and he didn't have any major concerns. He did, you know, really want these to be somewhat objective and somewhat kind of achievable. I mean, the last thing we want to do <clears throat> is kind of, you know, be suspending or revoking people's licenses in a year because they, you know, were trying to compare what they wrote in their application to what they did in practice. But he thinks all of these are kind of objective and achievable enough that we, you know, the enforcement of them would be um, relatively straightforward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Let me put back up this slide really quick. Yeah, yeah. sure. Gary, is there anything you wanted to add on any of this? I mean, you've lived through this licensing in the hemp world and in the agricultural world. No, I think you guys are on the right track. Yeah. I'll take a closer look at Kyle's slide. <laughs> I still feel like those are all solvents now. Yeah, apologies. I'm embarrassed. You know, it's funny through the legal education process. A lot of friends and family tell me that legal words and legal terms of art look very similar. And I think my mind not being the scientist that I am not overlooked that these are different words than the previous slide. So my apologies to everybody. <clears throat> so yes, these are the residual solvent parameters and limits. And again, you know, action limits kind of help determine what's safe for public health and public consumption. But these wouldn't necessarily live in rule. These would live through procedure with us because these are the ones where folks can get creative and um, you know, um, constantly find a new way to manufacture. And we don't want to continually have to add or subtract from this list. The other ones are a little bit more um, not as fluid. If I get up, keep going. I think I've sucked in a hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay and these slides will be up later today for folks or sometime soon um for folks to review great um do we want to have a conversation about co-location um i think co-location uh can take many different forms i mean we've talked about the limited retail license mm -hmm. as a form of co-location where you have a kind of store within a larger general store, a cannabis outlet kind of portion. We've talked about, um, of course, there's the integrated licenses with the vertically integrated companies that have, you know, their cultivation, and, you know, product manufacturing co-located. There's various license types all in one physical location. Um, there's the lice, there's the kind of idea of co-location where, you know, maybe one license uh, owner owns a warehouse and has multiple you know, cultivation stalls that they're renting out to various other licensees. Um, there's the various types of kind of producer co-op models um, that are kind of the cultivators are distributed, but they there's general ownership or common ownership of certain of the means of production and, and maybe some um, space, uh, physical space. Um, so I think uh, for the purposes of this conversation, I think the, the co-location that I'm really wanting to discuss is when one license holder owns a location um, and maybe rents out certain aspects of that uh, of that facility to other license holders. Um, this is allowed in other states, uh, notably Michigan. Um, some states do prohibit it, um, and some states have other kind of ways of allowing it but controlling it. Um, there 
there's obviously the, the main main benefit of this really is is that there are a lot of barriers to entry a lot of a lot of farmers out there that maybe have federal mortgages federally backed mortgages uh, that aren't that maybe thought that they were going to be able to cultivate on their land but maybe won't be able to um, you know the access to land access to capital it's really this is a way to have a low barrier to entry for folks that couldn't otherwise afford to participate um, there are some cons to this some possible um, problematic areas of kind of predatory relationships of the kind of, I'll just for lack of a better word, licensee landlord um, and the kind of lessee license holders. Um, you know, there's a certain amount of dependency on how much rent is being charged. There's kind of the ability to have what I would consider indirect control of the kind of primary landlord over the tenants. Um, there's some potential public safe, public health risks, um, depending on kind of air ventilation and people coming and going. Um, there's potential risk of cross contamination. Um, someone's using an illegal pesticide in one kind of stall and it gets filtered over to another stall and that person very much unintentionally uh, may have contaminated um, his or her flower. Um, and then, you know, another just consideration we should think about is how big could these co-located places be? Um, you know, should there be caps on that? You know, do we want them to be capped at, if we go down this path, do we, do we want them to be capped at kind of our largest license type? Do we want them to be smaller? Um, do we want them to be bigger? I mean, because, you know, truth is, is, you know, the one tenant, the, the kind of landlord isn't controlling directly these other people. So maybe there's an argument to be made that it could be bigger. Can I ask a question really quick sure. not to interrupt you. So are you thinking that like, let's say it's an outdoor grow or outdoor space and, you know, maybe it's, it's, they have two acres of land and would, would somebody own that land and then each respective license holder claim a thousand square foot pot on that land? Or are you saying that the land owner would seek those licenses themselves and then rent those? The first. The first. Okay. Yeah. Because that makes a lot of sense to me. I think also a pro here is shared labor, shared use of agricultural equipment and machinery right. because it's it's not cheap. Um, so I just wanted to reference right. those. Do you imagine this as being all the same license type? Like in Kyle's example, those would all be for the same license type, right? They'd all be cultivation. But could you have a large space like a, that's like partly a puzzle cultivation, partly manufacturing, and multiple different types of licenses? So the kind of potential for this, and I don't want to say predatory, but the 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 kind of potential for greater control over your tenants increases the more you own the means of production like if you have a if you have a testing facility mm -hmm. on location um, and you get to charge a fee to your tenants to use that well then you're charging rent that you can adjust and you're charging fees that you can adjust at your kind of at your discretion and so um, the potential for that kind of control um, increases of course um, I, I don't see why we wouldn't I just don't see why we wouldn't allow it, uh, you know, but I also just recognize these kind of problems. Yeah. Yeah. But does that go away, that control go away if it's actually, if they're all in one location, but they have a cooperative agreement? Like then wouldn't they discuss those businesses, those individual licenses, wouldn't they discuss how they're going to handle those things in advance? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think the pros outweigh the cons in trying uh -huh. to figure out a path forward. And I think we can set up, you know, an ability for folks to come and even anonymously let us know if they think that they're being a victim to some of these predatory type practices that will help us understand and induce our own kind of sleuthing to see what's, um, you know, what's going on. But in, with respect to recognizing not everybody's fortunate to have access to land and want to be part of this, I think. 
figuring out a path forward is important. As far as the cap goes, it's another, that's a different question. <laughs> Did we allow it to our, our, our largest, you know, square footage that's open for business? Are we violating statute if we go above that? I don't think there's nothing really about that yeah. statute. You guys so. can set the tier limits. Well, um, do you want to, David, bring up what we've been discussing? Yeah. Language? Hang on a second. You can see where we land and we can have, continue the discussion. I guess what David's bringing Sorry. up. <laughs> Didn't um, have it up right away. Yeah, I, I think uh, we want to have further discussion about whether one entity that owns a cultivation license, a product manufacturing license, and a retail license should or should not be allowed to co-locate in a single facility. I think they should. Yeah. yeah. All right. Just to that's a clear on that's, that's yeah. like a business decision. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's probably local issues that we're not thinking of, but they can work that out with right. the town. Yeah, if, if their zoning doesn't allow right. that, then yeah. they would just like. Sorry, that's really small. Hang on. Do you want to help us kind of understand? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sorry. So um, basically just trying to balance a bunch of the issues that you were just talking about, um, allowing people to co-locate, but not allow, trying to make sure that people are still behaving as individual licensees with their own individual businesses and not allowing sort of one landlord type of entity to extract a lot of the profit from people who are trying to get into this but don't have the means of um, paying for some of the startup costs and try to get into these situations but then ultimately a, a landlord type operator ends up extracting most of the profit from them trying to avoid that type of situation so a bit of a balance here and this tries to meet that balance and so we have the piece at the beginning just about making sure these larger operations still meet local regulations um, and then some of the more specific issues around how it all, how it should operate in those places. So cannabis establishments operating at the same location will do all of the following, have distinct and identifiable spaces, areas, or plots of each license operating in its own separate space area or plot. Post notice of the license. So um, the board or board designees can walk in and know what's going on. Um, maintain all the business operations compliance requirements and record keeping that an establishment would maintain if it were operating in its own location and then otherwise comply with the statutes and rules. Um, and then this is the piece about cultivation that you were talking about on C. Cultivation cannabis establishments must also comply with the limitations in sections 2.7 and 2.5.7. I know folks uh, on, the, uh, on the Teams meeting watching this uh, there, I don't have those references up here, my apologies, but those are basically sections that say that co-located co cultivators can only uh, have to the, like all the whole in, uh, of a co-located operation can't exceed the largest outdoor cultivation or indoor cultivation tier that the board has opened. So it does put that that's the cap you're talking about. That's the cap. You guys haven't decided on that, but that's just a placeholder for now. Basically saying we're referring to this other cap that's been proposed and not decided on yet. Uh, and the cap would be that the largest opened tier would be the limit for cultivation plant canopy uh, for co-located cultivators. And then the final piece is sort of a catch-all provision, making sure that people aren't using this type of co-location to get around the one license per entity rule that the legislature put in statute, which as and folks here obviously remember, um, entities can vert vertically integrate. So you can be a wholesaler, cultivator, retailer, and so forth if you wanted to do those three things, but you can't start accumulating multiple retailer licenses or multiple 
um, wholesaler licenses or manufacturing licenses. And one of the concerns around allowing co-location is that people could effectively uh, horizontally horizontally integrate because you know they're sort of in one location, they're combining business operations, and they start really appearing to be an entity that has multiple of the same license types, which the legislature did not allow. So the final piece is just a catch-all saying, hey, you know, we put all these other protections in there to try to avoid that, but if we think, uh, if, it, if it appears that there is an effect of getting around that anyway, uh, the board can step in and regulate as needed. For cultivation, if we went above our largest tier, how would that affect the security rules that we've discussed? Like if there was I'm no thinking, limit, you could have a sizable field, right? Of, I of, still think I would want to view it with respect to each individual plot. It mm -hmm. might look interesting if, let's say, it's a bunch of thousand square foot growers and they all pick different security measures on their plot. It would look, you know, like a science project where everybody has their own interpretation <laughs> of something, right. I guess. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I would, I would like to view it not on aggregate from that perspective, but to e respect to each individual. Plot. I think we don't I think that's the only way to to do it. Yeah. Right. And that's like and you can still share like if there's one security camera and you can put it at a certain distance that right. captures multiple. There's more pulling resources there for more expensive security measures, um, so on and so forth. I think what we would have to do, and I'm all for doing this, is put out some guidance recognizing that not every co-location might have like that cooperative model like there might be different inputs or agricultural practices used between i'm worried about drift and stuff like that mm -hmm. like like you mentioned as a con like what's what if so and so is using such and such pesticide and it leaches or right. there's drift um from product to product and there's cross contamination i think i'm hopeful we can we can figure out guidance for for helping folks not run into to testing issues, but on the flip side of that, if if your product is third party certified and pesticide free, and you're all pesticide free, and you can pull resources to help achieve that accreditation, you're you're helping everybody save money from a testing perspective potentially. So, I think the pros outweigh the cons, and I think we can deal with the cons as they arise and provide guidance on how to avoid some of the pitfalls that we're anxious about. We want to follow the recommendations in sub C there about just limiting these to our our tiering structure. Not go above that. I think I'm conscious of potential Act 250 implications for outdoor cultivation there and how much more complicated it could get. Yeah. If mm -hmm. we're allowing them to grow above our 37.5. That being said, I'd be comfortable moving in this direction now, we'll have public comment right. periods and people can come and tell us if they think that we're being a little bit too cautious. Yeah. All right, but you know, again, getting back to being able to pull resources, even if you have to get a 250 determination, multiple folks going and doing that is yeah. more cost effective from the same land use perspective than each individual landowner or land renter having to make get that determination. Yeah. I think it speaks to the character of how we like to operate, at least in the agriculture context and we want to. Yeah. I don't know if you want to vote or anything like that, but I'm for. Yeah. Well, if this is in our rules, we would vote Tuesday. next week. I don't know if we need more than one vote. I think that's fine. Yeah. Unless you feel different. I don't, because you also didn't vote on the last standards, and that's going to be okay. Right. Tuesday as well. There'll be the yeah. There'll be a few different votes, final votes on Tuesday yeah. anyway. So I think that makes sense. We could vote just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, great. So then the recommendation from us is to incorporate the lab standards. The uh, um, uh, 70903 criteria and the co-location into the rules for a final vote on Tuesday. You do have some final decisions to make on the 903. Yeah. 
Okay. The um, agenda. Let's see. Um, buffer zone discussion. Yeah. So I didn't create any slides. I could pull up the slides from the 22nd if you desire, but I think we sort of remember this conversation. Yep. Um, I proposed uh, buffer zones of 500 feet, um, but that a town could reduce that if they wanted to do so through ordinance or bylaw or increase it, but no more than a thousand feet. So <clears throat> as we've been going through the, the things that we proposed, I've continued to, to speak with people and, and get feedback. And um, the prevention community, uh, I have ongoing conversations with folks in the prevention community who pointed out that there is already statute that says that you can't go less than 500 feet. So the reduction by ordinance and bylaw probably can't right. be part of our rules. Um, but the other side of that, the increase, the intent of that recommendation was so that towns could not, um, you know, overrule a vote of their townspeople by creating an ordinance or a bylaw that made a, a buffer zone that was essentially the size of the town, right? But I'm not sure that that was the impact. So I think that we probably need to have discussion that um, provides us with um, advice. So we may need to move into executive session if you want to call a motion for that. Right. Yeah. Ask for a motion if you can. Yeah. <laughs> you have to ask and then I. <laughs> All right. Well, I would entertain a motion to move into executive this executive session. I move that the Cannabis Control Board go into executive session to consider confidential attorney client communications made for the purposes of providing professional legal services to the body and that the executive session is required because premature general public knowledge regarding such communications would clearly place the board at a substantial disadvantage. <laughs> <laughs> it's right. like I've done that before. <laughs> yeah. hey, okay, is there a second? To oh, second? Sorry, one other thing I forgot. Sorry. Can you just name if you would like any staff to remain with the board? Yes. The executive system. director and the general counsel. And um, okay, and do we have a rough estimate of how long we'll be in executive session for? No more than 10 minutes, maybe five okay. minutes. Five to 10 minutes. Uh, okay, so then we'll um, pause the. Well, is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, so before we move, uh, just to be clear, we're going to um, pause the recording. We're going to ask Orca to turn off the camera, and we'll be back in five to 10 minutes. Okay, we're recording. Great. Okay, so um, it's 12:20. We are um, now outside of executive session, back in our uh, cannabis board meeting. Um, we had a discussion about buffer zones, um, and I think the decision prior uh, that the board had made was to set a buffer zone um, from K through 12 schools of 500 feet. Um, and um, let towns have the authority to either decrease that or increase that. Um, we really, in our executive session, discussed that um, it might be more legally defensible and just a simpler process to follow our current drug-free school zone laws um, and more predictable and more clear, more clarity for potential licensees. So. Um, I think that I would entertain a motion to um, change uh, our prior recommendation on this. So I move to amend the Cannabis Control Board recommendation on buffer zones to reflect 18 VSA 4237. Second. Is that the motion we need? That's a sufficient yes. note to understand what you're saying. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, um, so that uh, brings us to our public comment period. Um, we have some people in the room, um, but uh, any public comments from the people in the room? No. Um, anyone who'd like to make a public comment that's joined via the link, please raise your hand and uh, we'll go in the order that you've raised your hand. Dave, do you wanna join us, Dave Silverman? Uh, thanks, I, I guess. Um... On the buffer zones, I'll go and do some research on what it is you just uh, approved. Uh, but on uh, with respect to co-location, um, so I'll, I'll first let me make a, a disclosure that um, I do represent a client uh, that has an interest in this decision, uh, although my comments today are not on behalf of that client. Um, I, I, I think that your 
your inclination to impose the um, license size cap on co-location, co-located grow facilities in the aggregate may have the unintended consequence of making it economically unviable to provide that kind of facility. If we're talking about 10 or 15 or 20,000 square feet, you know, if, if only 10,000 square foot is available to start or, you know, some something small to start, that means that, you know, for one, if you're doing 1,000 square foot micro plots, you're limited to 10 of those or 15 or 20 or whatever the case may be uh, with your ultimate decision there on, 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 on tiers. Um, and that would, uh, you know, if you allocate, you know, 10 such such plots in a 10,000 square foot universe uh, would leave no space for that person to also have their own facility. Um, and, and I, you know, from the folks that I've talked to, um, that's not, that just doesn't fit a business model that makes sense. Um, if, if the benefit that you see is to have somebody other than the small cultivator take up the large expense of uh, getting a facility, bringing that facility up to state of the art, uh, security, uh, HVAC, et cetera, uh, and uh, all of the racking and lighting and water filtration and so forth. Um, they may need more than just a small number uh, of those tenants uh, to make that investment worthwhile. Um, the, 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 the point of having a uh, preference for small growers, right, was to get to, to make it easy for them to get into the market. And, and I think that the idea of co-locating small growers has been kicking around uh, the advocacy community and in, in the legislature as well since 2015, uh, when the Vermont Cannabis Collaborative started proposing an intervale style grow. Um, and, and Chair Pepper, you, um, I know you were um, around doing cannabis stuff uh, at the time, so you'll, you'll recall uh, Bill Lofi's uh, group there uh, with Alan Newman and, and all those folks. Um, you know, and that was just one of the things that, that they were talking about all the way back then. Uh, and I think that was really something that we intended to to have uh, all along. Um, I, I agree with you that control, including indirect control, is a uh, important factor to consider and that we should not allow um, w people to control multiple licenses, but just say that they are landlords when in fact they really control their tenants. Um, but I don't think that the limit on the number of co-located tenants will really help anything um, if, if we can properly regulate around that control concern. Um, and I think that I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, next is Tito Byrne. Tito? Hi there. Um, so um, I'd like to just comment on co-location um, when it's pertaining to retail. Um, I do think it, it should be okay for a cannabis retail company to share a space with another company as long as that space meets all the security and structural requirements that the cannabis retail would have to would have to meet. Uh, that's all today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tito. Next is Ben Mervis. Hi, everybody. Uh, happy Friday. Thank you for all this work. Um, I have a few items, so I'll try to keep them quick. Uh, with lab limits, I just want to get this one out of the way. Kyle, great job. Um, there are people who are much better prepared to speak to us than I am, but just anecdotally, I want to share from the Massachusetts experience. Um, the limits were set in a way that was very restrictive for outdoor and living soil and regenerative soil cultivators. Um, it's something that I follow along peripherally. I am not 
I can't dive too far into cultivation, but like I said, there's people who definitely do know things about that. So I would um, make sure that you're speaking with them about those limits. Uh, with buffer zones, I, I don't know if it's been discussed, I'm sorry if it has been, but uh, some clarification about whether or not this applies to all licensed operations or if it is just particular licensed operations. And then most importantly, um, we're concerned with when the buffer zones will be basically enforced. So if an applicant applies for their provisional license and is granted a provisional, but then a school moves a, a daycare, um, sorry, daycare isn't included, if a kindergarten, if any school moves closer, you know, is that applicant, is that licensee in danger of losing their um, location if they've already gotten their provisional license? Um, regarding co-location, I do think that it's incredibly important. It's something that Craig and I have, have absolutely been discussing with our business plans. We do think it would be important, and we're, we're planning on this ourselves, but maybe a requirement for an SOP that accounts for things like contamination um, and with the number of people in the building, number of people per square foot, there's a lot of different ways to work that so that you can make sure the uh, quality and, and um, that the space remains safe and of quality. Also in the subsection B of the general counsel's language, uh, I think it is important to point out that, and this was mentioned, that a lot of co-located businesses, particularly in an incubation setting, might be sharing um, machinery or any types of surfaces. So the distinct and identifiable spaces are great for things like finished goods or even for raw materials, but for active production and processing space, it's important for these co-located businesses to be able to share to that space. So again, an SOP that requires um, proper cleaning and sanitation between use would, would maybe be a great way to address that. Um, with the B Corporation, that's that's where I'll leave it. Um, I do just want to share anecdotally, I've heard there are many, many months, if not years of delays in that certification process right now. I've led the charge of getting businesses B Corp certified before. I can tell you it it is mostly marketing. Um, so I think it's the the requirements that are in place that your board is putting in place really set a higher standard from what I've seen from B Corps. And so any business that's following these standards or, or going above the minimum as you're requesting, they should be able to apply for B Corp and, and handle that in their own time, but not have it factor into their application. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ben. Next is Jeffrey Pizzatullo. Thank you. Um, I've got two quick points. Um, going back to the testing requirements discussion, um, I'm looking at a slide that Kyle had presented. Uh, I first want to thank Carrie, Kyle, and others that had worked on these recommendations. Uh, I think in their totality, they are uh, on point, and we would agree with much of them, except for um, the total uh, yeast and mold count. And thank you, Ben, for raising this. Um, you guys uh, had, uh, it looks like, sounds like considered Oregon's uh, rules around testing and sampling um, and integrated a lot of that. We appreciate that. Um, in speaking with friends out in Oregon and other states, uh, please know that uh, small farms and businesses have been advocating to remove the total use and mold uh, that is in Oregon statute. Uh, and they're actually just about to uh, get it successfully removed. So we would hope that we would not adopt that in our state um, we do recommend testing cannabis for water activity and specific pathogenic organisms. That's like by species, basically, rather than general activity, which is what we're at least seem to be suggesting in this slide. And maybe I'm reading it wrong. Um, so that would have an impact on our small farms and our small businesses in the state, notably uh, outdoor production, uh, mixed light, and even some indoor production. If we were to keep that in statute, that would mean that uh, we would not see uh, the farming practices that are mostly considered higher quality product reaching our marketplace, uh, and that would set us back. Uh, and that would also uh, really not satisfy uh, the intent of the enabling statute, which is to transition uh, the illicit market actors. So it's critical that we do not adopt total use, uh, use and mold count uh, for our regulatory uh, when it comes to testing requirements uh, as Oregon and others are about to move past that. So thank you. And really briefly, um, in um, 
One of the slides, uh, you had testing for THC uh, and uh, concentrates. Uh, uh, is all concentrates being tested at uh, limited to 60% or is it just um, solid? Uh, you guys might want to specify that in one of your slides. Um, and I would just like to take this uh, opportunity very briefly to point out and remind everybody that THC in cannabis, the plant, varies per plant. It's not a precisely manufactured product like concentrate. So, um, you know, on a cannabis plant, you can get, you know, say 30% THC up top, and it can be, you know, 20% down below on that same exact plant. Uh, this is why other states like Oregon are moving towards THC ranges. They're finding that specific numbers aren't really accurate. Uh, things to consider, uh, and thanks for your work. Thanks, Jeffrey. Next is THC analytics. Hello, guys. Thank you for your time. Uh, just quickly, I want to um, uh, back up what uh, everyone has said so far. I do want to uh, also add that what happens. Oh, geez, what just happened? <laughs> you still hear me? OK, what happens if a school uh, moves in while we're already in business? Um, not only that, but uh, like uh, others said, uh, what? Uh, uh, um, oh, geez. Sorry, I'm trying to deal with this signing now. Uh, I'm, I apologize. I'll just speak. What happens if somebody, if, if school moves in while we're already in business, and uh, year two, um, to our licenses, do we have to worry about that, or does a school have to worry about us being that close to them? Um, the other thing that I wanted to touch base on, and I'm and I escaped my thought of uh, frame of thought because of this again. Um, Jeez. Uh, oh yes, uh, in all uh, these limits, the 500 foot limit gonna be um, for every license. Like uh, uh, like myself, uh, we're planning to open up an analytic lab laboratory for THC products, and we are worried about that 500 uh, square foot. A 500 foot limit because it will uh, it will impact where we sit. Um, but that's all I have. I'm trying to mute myself and but I can't do it. I'm still blank on my uh, end. We can we can yeah. mute you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next is Erica French. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Hello there. Oh, good. Thank you. This is my first time calling in. I just want to thank you so much for the way that you're looking out for women and minorities and all of this and for Vermonters. I really appreciate you for that. <clears throat> and um, I'm calling in. I did hear a little bit earlier in the call that you guys were thinking about having the larger licensees provide some training and support to cultivators or um, provide jobs. And I wanted to talk about the possibility of supporting the smaller licensees, the women and people of color. Um, I think that um, inside of, now I'm not the best at legalese, <clears throat> but I think that Act 164, Section 903 talks about providing training. And so I think that basic basic training would help people to pass tests um, and it would help them avoid the need to circumvent the standards that you guys set if they had just basic cultivation understanding. And some of them may want to hop into this business and they may not have that. <clears throat> that would also obviously have macroeconomic benefits. Um, and obviously you guys will be setting the standards for cultivation, soil biology, pH, um, what types of nutrients are used to feed the plants, harvest practices. I wanted to offer myself uh, my services if you need any help figuring out how to do that. I don't assume that you do, but if you did, I'd love to help. I'd love to help um, these women and people of color get up to speed so they can be really successful. 
And my business is Kind Green Insight LLC. You can find me at www.kindgreeninsight.com. And once again, thank you for the moment. I just think it would be really great to have a non-inspecting best practices officer who could help um, Vermonters. Thank you so much. Thank you, Erica. Anyone else? Is anyone joined by, by phone? Uh, they did, but they're gone. Okay. All right. Um, well, before we adjourn, just want to remind folks about the town hall tomorrow. It's at the Waterbury State Office Complex. Um, if you want to attend in person, and then if you'd like to attend virtually, um, the link to join uh, by video is on our website. Um, so really hope um, that the folks on this call and anyone watching can, um, can join us. And with that, I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you. Thank you.